Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sean Pisses Off Republicans. Assuming any of them still watch my show, I imagine I scared most of them off a while back, and possibly a few Democrats as well. I don't know if I've scared off the Libertarians, but then again, I don't know if Libertarians ever watch my show to begin with. I am over 18. Anyway, my quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture brings me now to a moment I have been dreading for quite some time. Absolute proof. And I'm gonna need some absolute proof to get through this, let me tell you. The 41st annual Golden Raspberry Awards took place in 2021, which one would think means they should have been honoring the worst movies of 2020. But for some reason, they also included two early 2021 releases among the nominees, including Absolute Proof. It was an odd choice, but then it was an odd time. The COVID-19 pandemic hit the world hard that year, and the movie industry was certainly not immune. Movie theaters were closed for months, causing several releases to be postponed. The few that were released went directly to streaming platforms or VOD. So I suppose the pickings would have been slim that year. That said, this still feels like cheating. Surely there were enough bad movies released in 2020 that they didn't have to dip into 2021. And they still overlook some obvious choices. How did Artemis Fowl not get a single nomination in any category? I don't think it necessarily should have won Worst Picture. We'll get to that. But it was bad enough that it should have at least been considered. And it was actually released in 2020. But anyway, let's talk about the movie that did win. Absolute Proof comes to us from Mike Lindell, who, prior to his descent into madness, was the founder and creepy-ass spokesman for MyPillow, a company that has been sued multiple times for false advertising. He also promoted the plant extract oleandrin as an alternative treatment for COVID-19, despite there being no scientific evidence to support his claims and the fact that oleandrin is, you know, poison. After President Donald Trump lost his bid for re-election in 2020, and that is exactly what happened. Donald Trump lost the 2020 presidential election. This pillow peddler decided to take his talent for bullshit spewing from the corporate world to the political world and became heavily involved in Trump's attempts to overturn the election, despite there being zero evidence to this day of any shenanigans in said election. Because there were no shenanigans, Donald Trump fairly and legally lost the 2020 presidential election. This eventually led Lindell, along with Mary Fanning and Brennan Howes, to create the docu-movie Absolute Proof, exposing election fraud and the theft of America by enemies foreign and domestic. Hey Mike, literally no one uses the term docu-movie. You can just call it a documentary. It's still not accurate, but at least it's an actual word. Also, they clearly took that background from The Matrix and just colored it red. I'd say the Wachowski should sue, but I don't know if they'd get anything out of it because after Dominion is done with him, Mike may not have anything left. Anyway, Lindell claimed his movie would show exactly what it says on the label. Absolute proof that the Democrats conspire to steal the election by rigging the voting machines and switching votes from Trump to Biden. Curiously, they did not use these same tactics to switch votes from Republican House and Senate candidates to ensure they would have a majority in both houses of Congress. They didn't try to get rid of Kevin McCarthy or Mitch McConnell. Nope. Just Trump. It's one of many reasons why this conspiracy theory is incredibly stupid, even by conspiracy theory standards. Anyway, Lindell wastes no time spewing bullshit, which is his bread and butter, to be fair, and begins his insane theory by stating the algorithms for the voting machines made by Dominion and Smartmatic broke which is total nonsense. An algorithm is not something you can break. In simple terms, an algorithm is a set of instructions for solving a math problem. You can't break math, that's not a thing. He further claims the algorithms broke because Trump got millions more votes than expected, but he doesn't even attempt to explain how this works, I assume because he's just making this shit up as he goes. Also, if Trump supposedly got millions more votes than anyone expected, if anything, wouldn't that indicate potential fraud on Trump's part? You really didn't think this one through, did you, Mike? And he goes on about how it took several states a long time to count their votes and how it took several days to confirm the winner of the election, which he claims is unprecedented despite the fact that the same thing happened with Bush versus Gore. The year 2000 wasn't that long ago, Mike. Good Lord. All these big, you know, votes that were poured in, nobody understood it, right? I can see why he likes Donald Trump, who lost the 2020 presidential election. Much like Trump, he assumes if he doesn't understand something, no one does. 
Can you say Dunning-Kruger effect, boys and girls? Moving on, Mike presents a bunch of charts that purport to show thousands of fraudulent votes cast in various states. There's no explanation of where these numbers came from or how they know they're accurate, nor is there proof that these allegedly fraudulent votes were included in the official results. Because yes, people do try to cast fraudulent votes, but such attempts are almost always caught, and as the numerous and expensive hand recounts have shown, the official vote totals were accurate. Believe it or not, election officials tend to know what they're doing. Mike, on the other hand, Bizarrely, Mr. Lindell also acknowledges Trump tried to convince the Georgia Secretary of State to find him more votes. This blows my mind, especially considering the recent indictments. You're supposed to be showing absolute proof that the Democrats tried to steal the election, and here you are talking about Trump trying to do that very thing. It's like Dinesh D'Souza's Richard Spencer interview all over again. He also whines about how everyone is trying to silence him and suppress his speech, which is technically true, but not for the reasons he claims. You're not some truth teller that people are afraid of, Mike. You're a deranged lunatic with nothing of value to say, and people are telling you to shut the fuck up because they are tired of hearing your insane ramblings. Also, you're using your platform for defamation, and believe it or not, the First Amendment does not protect you from getting sued for that. How are your lawsuits going, by the way? Anyway, once Mike finally runs out of words, he interviews a series of people, some in studio, some over the internet, who basically just repeat the same bullshit he was saying. Several of them claim to have seen evidence or heard from witnesses that can prove votes were switched from Trump to Biden. But said evidence is never actually presented, nor do we hear from these supposed witnesses, so... Still waiting for that absolute proof, Mike. And several of these people spend an inordinate amount of time talking about Antrim County, Michigan, where a clerical error initially showed a landslide victory for Biden. Again, this doesn't actually prove anything. A mistake was made, not by a rigged voting machine, but by an actual human being, a county clerk who, by the way, is a Republican. She quickly caught the mistake and corrected it, and that should have been the end of it. Unfortunately, we are living in the dumbest timeline. Most of the people participating in this docu-movie are not particularly noteworthy, but there are a couple of hilarious exceptions. One of them is Melissa Caroni, who you might remember as Rudy Giuliani's infamous whistleblower who, unsurprisingly, turned out to be completely full of shit. Hilariously, she tried to cash in on her 15 minutes of fame by running for office a couple of times, but was disqualified for lying on the paperwork. I am Jax complete lack of surprise. And there's Dr. Shiva Ayadurai, who claims to have invented email in 1979. While his software was indeed called email, and he may have been the first to use the term, a process for sending electronic messages between computers has existed since 1971, which is why many historians have called his claims into question. He notoriously sued the tech policy blog TechDirt for this very thing, but all he got out of it was a link to his rebuttal in TechDirt's articles. He's also an anti-vaccine activist and promoted unfounded COVID-19 treatments, so it's no wonder Mike likes him, and he claims to be a victim of election fraud himself as he ran for Senate in Massachusetts in 2020 and, to hear him tell it, lost the Republican primary due to the state allegedly destroying over one million ballots. That would mean approximately one and a quarter million people would have cast votes in the Republican primary in Massachusetts in 2020. A remarkable claim considering as of 2016, the state of Massachusetts only had about half a million registered Republican voters. Does that mean the state threw out a shitload of independent voters' ballots? Or is Dr. Ayadurai simply a liar and a fraud? Who can say? Apparently, I can't if I don't want to get sued. No one has rebutted my mathematical explanation showing that they multiplied my, my votes by 0.666. Oh, really? They multiplied your votes by 0.666, huh? Well, gee, who do you suppose could have been responsible for the election fraud? I just don't know. Who could it be? Could it be... Satan? <laughs> 0.666. Subtlety is a lost art, I swear to God. Also, Dr. Ayadurai officially got 104,782 votes. Dividing that by 0.666 doesn't come anywhere close to the over 1 million allegedly destroyed ballots. It's about 53,000. And even if you add that to his total, he still lost.
And the cherry on top of this shit Sunday comes to us in the form of a phone interview with Mary Fanning, one of the aforementioned producers of this mess. I found it curious that she chose to appear by phone when everyone else was willing to appear on camera, and it turns out very little is known about her. She has no internet footprint nor any track record as a journalist, despite claiming to be one. No official photographs of her have been found. I've seen one person on Twitter, I'm not calling it X, post what they claim is a photo of Mary, and another claiming she's a former CIA operative gone rogue, but these people seem to be about as sketchy as Mary herself, so I have my doubts. Literally all we know for sure about Mary Fanning, if that is indeed her real name, is what her voice sounds like. Well, I don't know about you, but I trust her implicitly. Mary presents several charts that supposedly show successful attempts at hacking into voting systems along with the number of votes changed. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, but no, they do not explain how they came up with this information apart from some vague statements about packet captures. However, it was later revealed to have come from a discredited former government contractor named Dennis Montgomery who has a history of making outlandish claims. An article in Playboy magazine referred to him as the man who conned the Pentagon, as he once scored a $20 million government contract after claiming he had software that could detect messages to Al-Qaeda sleeper cells hidden in Al Jazeera broadcasts. The government later discovered his software was an elaborate hoax. Well, I don't know about you, but I trust him implicitly. Mary, this is incredible. Well, since the definition of incredible is not credible, I would agree. There's some other stuff in here about government censorship and media censorship and cancel culture and globalists and socialists and communists and various other ists, but you get the idea. In the end, Absolute Proof provided no proof of the Pillow Peddler's claims, absolute or otherwise. Mike released a couple of follow-up docu-movies that also didn't prove anything, and hosted a cyber symposium that also didn't prove anything. One expert went into that panel expecting to receive a truckload of data that didn't actually support Mike's claims, but reportedly, he didn't even get that. Mike literally provided nothing. Lindell would continue to provide new definitions for the word preposterous, claiming he had enough evidence to put 300 million people in prison, which is over 90% of the US population, and claimed Trump would be reinstated as president on August 13th. After that day came and went, he revised his prediction to September 30th. That day also came and went. Mike and others who push the big lie are basically rapture predictors at this point. And he's still peddling his bullshit to this day. But all of this political stuff is not really why we're here. We all know Mike Lindell and his associates are full of shit. That was never in question for anyone with two brain cells to rub together. The real question is, is absolute proof at least well made? Oh, Lord no. Mike claims he made absolute proof over the course of five days, getting about three hours of sleep a night. This is one of the few times where I think he is actually telling the truth. He looks like he very hastily threw this together on about three hours of sleep, and almost certainly only did one take, considering how often he stumbles over his words and mispronounces people's names. And that's just from social media, like Jack Dorsey, like Mark Zuckerbuck. Mark Zuckerbuck? You know what? I, for one, think we should all start calling him that. And Mike occasionally says some really weird shit, like this moment where he's complaining about how he's been silenced. You ever notice the people who claim to have been silenced are always the loudest sons of bitches walking God's green earth? Anyway, what exactly have they been doing to you, Mike? They're suppressing cancel culture. Oh, they're... what? They're suppressing cancel culture. They're suppressing cancel culture. Sir, I don't think that's what you meant to say. I think you had two different thoughts swirling around up here, and one made a wrong turn somewhere and crashed into the other. And that is why you do not sit down in front of a camera after three hours of sleep. You will inevitably film yourself saying something incredibly stupid. I may or may not be speaking from experience. Mike also originally claimed the movie would be about three hours, but the version that was released to the public, although it wasn't so much released as vomited, runs about two hours. But I can believe it was originally supposed to be three and was hastily edited down to two because OAN would only give him that much airtime. I lost count of how many times the video very abruptly faded out, often as Mike or his guests were in mid-sentence. There's a sequence where they literally fade out and back in three times in 20 seconds. Did James Wynn edit this? 
Mike also demonstrates several times that he is incapable of speaking into the microphone as he keeps turning away to look at the charts behind him. When he video chats with people, he doesn't even bother to crop out the software icons. And their use of stock footage is, frankly, hilarious. We're talking about servers. Let's show the audience what servers might look like. Now we're talking about the voting machine code. So, here's some code. It's nothing like the code used in the voting machines, but that's okay, our audience won't know the difference. And while most of the movie has no score, every once in a while, seemingly at random, they will throw in this dramatic music. Sometimes it almost gets loud enough to drown them out. Again, did James Wynn edit this? Well, that's absolute proof. It's two hours of the poorly produced and hastily edited ramblings of a madman and his enablers. And the only thing it absolutely proved is Mike Lindell is absolutely nuts. Oddly enough, it doesn't appear to me that he's doing this as a grift. He basically gave absolute proof away for free. He uploaded it to various sites, although most took it down because there's enough election misinformation out there, thank you very much. He gave away the DVD for free plus shipping and handling, and it aired for free on OAN, though they hilariously preceded it with a lengthy, and I do mean lengthy, disclaimer, which basically said, everything you are about to see is all on Mike, we just gave him the airtime he paid for, pretty please don't sue us. Shockingly, it turns out saying, pretty please don't sue, does not actually prevent people from suing you. Who knew? The point I'm trying to make here is, if anyone has been taken financial advantage of, it's Mike himself. He's dumped so much of his own money into Absolute Proof, the Cyber Symposium, and various other projects, and plenty of people around him are happy to reap the rewards. I'm sure most of them don't actually believe this bullshit, but they're happy to go along with it as long as the check's clear. But does Mike actually believe what he's saying? Or is he just desperate to curry favor with Trump and his allies because he badly wants to be part of something bigger than he is? I honestly don't know, and I have neither the time nor the patience to play armchair psychiatrist. Let's just say he's clearly unwell and leave it at that. And let's get to that big, all-important question that we keep asking ourselves as we journey through the worst Hollywood has to offer. Did the Razzies get it right? Was this really the worst picture of the year? And two months. I'm going to say no for one very important reason. I don't think this qualifies as a movie. All he's doing is sitting behind a desk in his basement or an abandoned warehouse or wherever the hell they film this, ranting and raving and showing so-called proof and interviewing people who support his insanity. It's not much different from the shit you would see from someone like Alex Jones. Despite the confusing label Mike attached to his work, this is not a movie. It's a glorified conspiracy theory podcast that went a little off the rails, and I don't think the Razzies had any business talking about it. It's terrible and easy to make fun of, and so is Mike Lindell, but absolute proof is not a movie. At least the other Worst Picture nominees were actually movies. Doolittle, a horribly misguided adaptation of Dr. Doolittle, even by the standards set by the previous movies, Fantasy Island, a reimagining of the classic TV series as a horror movie with mixed results, if we're being generous, and Music, a musical drama directed by Sia and featuring Maddie Ziegler making the same mistake Ben Stiller's character made in Tropic Thunder. She went full Simple Jack. You never go full Simple Jack. But for my money, the last nominee is the one that should have won Worst Picture. 365 Days. Let me tell you people about 365 days. Please have your sick bags at the ready. This is a Polish film, although most of the dialogue is in English, and is based on the novel of the same name by Blanka Lipinska. It's yet another series of erotic fiction trying to cash in on the craze that started with Fifty Shades of Grey, which Lipinska cites as an inspiration. And it's somehow more problematic than Fifty Shades ever was. Fifty Shades was terrible for romanticizing abusive relationships. 365 Days takes that one step further and romanticizes kidnapping. Basically, the leader of a Sicilian crime family kidnaps a young woman and says he intends to keep her prisoner for 365 days in the hopes that in that time, she will fall in love with him. And somehow, she does. I did warn you people about the sick bags. I honestly tried to give this movie the benefit of the doubt, but it genuinely is as bad as it sounds based on the premise, and everyone involved with this crap is bad and they should feel bad. And even if you could somehow overlook the premise, and that's a big if, it's still a terrible movie. The acting isn't very good, the dialogue is shit, it ends on a cliffhanger that comes right the fuck out of nowhere, and the sex scenes, which I'm pretty sure account for most of the second half of the movie, are bad. Really, really bad. 
And yet, it was the number one movie on Netflix in the US when it premiered, and hit the top three in multiple countries around the world. And it spawned two sequels. What the hell is wrong with you people? Why are you watching this tripe? Yes, I know, I watched it too, but I'm a critic, I did it for the show. What's your excuse? For my money, this is the worst movie of 2020, and it's not even close. Yes, music was also pretty terrible, but like Absolute Proof, that was also released in early 2021. You're cheating, Razzies. And I do not recommend checking it out, not even to hate watch it. There's not really anything worth making fun of, it's just bad. As for Absolute Proof, I did at least get a couple of laughs out of it, but I still don't think it's worth your time. If you want to watch Mike Lindell embarrass himself, he tends to do that every few months. You won't have to seek it out, it'll just happen. Well, thank God that's over, and I never have to talk about political figures ever again. So, what's the next Worst Picture winner? Oh, God damn it. Okay, um, what?